Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome. And Ed, thanks for the shout out on the choice of music. Um, uh, we might introduce music as a new feature of our FSC Connects. Um, so today, um, uh, it, we're all about um, getting into the Getting Shape agenda and really by popular demand um, in response to a lot of feedback. Um, this session is all about going into a lot of detail uh, to help people make good quality and informed decisions. And as we play through the uh, uh, Get In Shape agenda, that's kind of where we're going to head to. And so again, uh, as you go through this session, if there are the other topics you want to hear more of, uh, from people with expertise, we'd love to hear uh, from you. And today, of course, we are joined by two uh, uh, excellent and long-term experts with a bunch of expertise, particularly in around how the sector's transitioning uh, through the FISLA world. And that is uh, Mark Benisevich, who has been uh, the inspirational chair of the FSC's Advisor Transition Working Group. Um, and obviously uh, a key part of the partners team and none other than Tim Williams from Chapman Trip who has uh, um, uh, been a, a key part of our reg committee and our reg response uh, and again consulting right across the marketplace. So we're in for a treat, um, in for a good discussion. Um, I'm going to leave you in Mark's very capable hands. I'll turn the music down um, and uh, see you at the end of the program. Thanks very much all and Mark over to you. Thank you Richard. So here we go. The topic of today's presentation is around structuring for the new regime. And as Richard said, what we plan to do over the next sort of six to nine months is have a fortnightly webinar that starts to dig into a little bit of the detail about preparing for this regime. Some of these webinars will be uh, targeted at advisors, individual advisors. Some will be targeted at advisor businesses. This one is more around every individual advisor making the decision about how they're going to transition. I'm very lucky to have Tim with me. Uh, Tim, as many of you know, has been a partner at Chapman Trip for almost 25 years. I don't know whether that makes me feel young or incompetent, uh, but I'd rather not make that decision right now. Uh, but So the way we're going to approach this webinar is, is I'll kind of uh, introduce the main topic of each slide and then Tim will, will jump in with his expertise. Um, the starting point that I want to make here is that you don't have as long as you think. So uh, in terms of the timeline that we know about, it's been moved, of course, for COVID-19. We know that every financial advisor has to be engaged by an entity with a transitional license by early 2021, which we expect means around March 2021. And final implementation is in early 2023. And by that stage, of course, you need to have your level five certificate or equivalency. Uh, and by that stage, every business will be operating under a full license issued by the FMA. The key thing to note here, though, is you don't have until early 2023 to get a full license. The FMA has and needs the power to take this transitional licensing population, cut it up into smaller groups and give each group an earlier deadline, which they did during the Financial Markets Conduct Act licensing period, uh, where I remember specifically them giving a deadline to uh, manage the MIS schemes. Because if they didn't do that, then they'd have a thousand applications, uh, you know, the, the last week or the last month before the end, and we, they wouldn't be able to issue the licenses in time. So don't think of early 2023 as the date to be ready for this new regime with your business. You need to have your business ready, really, by early 2021. What we're going to cover off today is making the decision. So as an individual advisor, are you going to be engaged by another entity with a license or are you going to apply for a license for your own business? We're going to talk about the sorts of things that are involved in being engaged by another uh, business and in particular the sorts of things you need to, to need, need to discuss with that business owner and then we're going to walk through some common structures for licensing. So this will apply to the majority of small businesses. Uh, there are a lot of complexities for, for large businesses and indeed some small businesses uh, have some more complex structures as well. Uh, we would kind of encourage people to keep it as simple as possible. Um, getting into the, into the detail here, first part making the decision. First point I want to make here is it's very important to consider the advantages and disadvantages carefully before you make a decision. As usual, if you've got any questions as we go, feel free to whack them into Q&A. I think, I'm not sure whether I can see Q&A, but I'm sure uh, Naomi or David who are watching in the background will, will fire us the questions if they come through. Nice easy point to start with, 
to consider what your options are. So by early 2021, all financial advisors must be engaged by a financial advice provider with a transitional license. That means you either, as a financial advisor, have to be engaged by an entity with a license, you have to obtain a license for your own business, or there are a couple of other options. One, it is possible to not give advice to retail clients and therefore not need to be licensed, but be very careful with that. So the, the key point here is that the majority of uh, small businesses that many advisors will deal with, we may think of them as not being retail, but according to the legal requirements, they are. They're not wholesale. So most small business owners that you're dealing with will still be retail clients. So it's really only the very, very large in the town and very specialist businesses that qualify outside of that. So it's not really going to be an option for most financial advisors. The, the fourth option there is, is of course, to, to exit the industry altogether. Uh, and hopefully, you know, most of, most of our financial advisors won't do that. We know there are not enough financial advisors in the New Zealand market. We want more of you, not less. So, and we also know the retirement age for financial advisors in New Zealand, I think is about 85. Uh, so, you know, no excuses. No, I'm, I'm 63. Uh, it's time for me to give this up. No, no, you've got another 20 years. I'm pretty sure that's the, the um, not this, it's the, the cultural retirement age for a financial advisor, I believe is about 85. So really we're, we're focusing today on those first two options, uh, to be engaged by an entity with a license or to obtain a license for your business. If you do want to know a little bit more about the third one, not giving a financial advice to retail clients, then highly recommend you take some legal advice on that because it's a very specialist area. And, uh, we have a number of people available for that. Okay, so now we're going to get into the grunt of this, the key thing, uh, the stuff we're, we're more familiar with here. The first thing on the, on the left-hand side of the screen here, you've got the advantages of, ta- of obtaining your own license. And then on the right-hand side of the screen, you've got the advantages of being engaged by another business. And the next slide is going to have the disadvantages. So I'm going to run through them quickly and then I'm going to ask Tim for his comments and he's going to pick out some of the key ones that may be a little bit tricky. Clearly the disadvantages will be the inverse of the advantages to some extent, but there are some some differences. The first advantage for licensing is of course, you have the control of your own systems and processes. You get to determine how you give advice, how you run your business. You also control contagion risk. And what we mean by this is if you're working for somebody else and some other financial advisor in the business does something egregious uh, and is, is dragged uh, over the coals for it, there may be impacts on all financial advisors under the same license. So uh, you can control that contagion risk if you've got your own license. Of course, you get to control the strategy and risk of the business. You get to determine what products you, you're going to offer, um, how you're going to offer them, those sorts of things. Uh, and and the, th- the final one that we've listed here at the moment is around enhanced ability to sell the business. So if you come to the stage where, you, where it's time to exit or you want to do something else, if you have a licensed entity, you've got something up that's very easy to pick up and sell. Okay. The, on the other side of it, if you're engaged by another entity, to a large extent, you've got limited liability, although I know that Tim's going to talk about this a little bit more because um, it, although we understand that you have liability limits. You can be brought before the Financial Advice Disciplinary Committee and be fined up to about $10,000, but there is additional liability if you're involved in the contravention of, of uh, and involved in a contravention, which Tim will elaborate on. Uh, You are responsible for your advice, but the licensee is responsible for ensuring that all financial advice issued under the business is given uh, according to the law. So licensee carries responsibility for the advice obligations. They also carry responsibility for business compliance, making sure that the business complies with all the requirements under the license. There are also licensing fees and levies and so forth, which in in most cases, well, the licensee will certainly pay for them for the business. They may have an arrangement with the advisors to pay them for the financial advisor, but certainly a huge chunk of it will be paid by the licensee. And the other key thing is that as requirements change or as the FMA issues guidance, it's the licensee that will be responsible for making sure that everything is up to date. So as, a, as somebody engaged, you're responsible for the advice you give, you keep on doing the job, you, you do it in the process that's been uh, given to you by the licensee. Everything else around that is the responsibility of the licensee. Um, Tim, I know there's a couple of points on that slide that you want to comment on. Yeah, I think um, one of the key um advantages of allowing someone else to take control is that they, um, particularly if they've got some scale, will be able to establish better um, practices potentially um, and impose, you know, the learnings that one gathers around the um, 
about the industry requirements. There are a whole range of new duties that are coming into play um, as uh, effective, and this is an important point, uh, early March next year, they, they arise primarily except for the requirement for education um, uh, effective on early March next year. And um, But larger businesses may well have set up and spent the time setting up those, those processes. So as I say, there's a range of duties under the legislation, including um, to... Uh, um, give priority to the to the, um, to the interests of your clients um, to exercise care, diligence, and skill, and the like. Um, all of that uh, will be there will be expectations that these will be sort of documented um, through uh, promise uh, through uh, policies, procedures, and controls. Um, and the and the FMA uh, will expect to be you to be able to demonstrate that you're complying with those things. So. Um, there'll be a range of, of steps that, um, that advisors will need to be taking. Uh, if you engage in someone else's um, uh, FAP licence, they've got an obligation to make sure that you are uh, being compliant. They will prepare, for example, the disclosures that need to be made under legislation and have those checked. The sort of um, economies of scale um, and, um, and, and if, you, if you engage under um, a FAP that, and you'll be able to benefit from their compliance uh, processes and control. Um, uh, that said, as you said before, the, the independence that many people seek and the ability to sell one's book, for example, uh, will, be, um, uh, will be more suitable under um, the, uh, if, you're, if you decide to go your own route. One point you might decide to do equally is to, um, is, is to establish yourself initially through the transition period as, um, as, as your own path but then pair up at the later stage um, uh, with, uh, with an, an organisation once you've, you've tested the waters of the and seen if you can do that. But the key thing to remember if you do that um, is that you've got to be compliant from day one, from March uh, 2021. Um, I'll talk more, to, more later, perhaps just briefly outlining outline, the, um, the sorts of procedures and controls and, and steps that one needs to put in place in advance. But for now, um, that's an important point. Picking up the liability uh, aspects um, involved in the contravention. Many people have heard the sort of the key sound by it that the liability will fall on the taps, um, except uh, you can be sent to the disciplinary tribunal, um, and that has a limit of liability of, of ten thousand um, dollars. But uh, if you're involved in the contravention um, of your FAP by virtue of being the party who has caused the breach, uh, then in those cases, you can be brought back in under the way the FMCA works uh, and, and be liable um, for much greater penalties. Um, so that's something that probably many people don't, uh, don't appreciate. Um, I think that's most of the comments I've got to make. Uh, licensing costs are a factor um, uh, in all of this. And, and the other point about that is that they are, they are a moving piece. We've been told what they will be for next year. Uh, licensing fees um, and levies uh, uh, are going to be increased over the next three year period. The amounts uh, that have been announced don't actually foreshadow what the um, FAP licensing fees and the Air financial advisors will be. So um, that's a bit of an uncertainty, but I guess um, the best proxy for that is what we know now, which is uh, the numbers that have been indicated to date. Um, and, um, and with the delay, um, the uh, of the of the um, FSLA regime, um, there will be um, you know those will those will change um, maybe even from the beginning uh, prior to the commencement of the regime, but at least during the course of the regime, which will make a difference. Um, that's probably enough for me at this stage, but uh, happy to answer any questions. That's great. Thanks. So we've had a couple of good questions come through. There's one question around uh, structure that I'd like to delay until later in the presentation when we talk about structures. Uh, another question here asking about what happens if someone decides to start their own uh, financial advice provider business after the transition period begins, so from early 2021, and between that, that period from early 2021 to early, 20, uh, to early 2023. And the answer to that question is you'll have to apply for a full license. So the, the transitional license does not apply to anybody who starts a financial advice provider business after early 2021. It applies to businesses that are in existence right now and obtain a transitional license. Okay, so that's the, the short answer to that question. Okay, next slide. So now we're- There are also restrictions, um, Mark. Sorry. Mark, there are also restrictions on engaging um, 
in in ours nominated representatives during the, the transition period, which might, will be something to bear in mind as well. So, if you do start during that transition phase, um, uh, oh, well, actually, that's not quite right. If you if you uh, during that transition phase, people cannot engage nominated representatives um, while they're under a transitional license. So, it's a different point in a way. Um, and so uh, it might push people to switch earlier to being um, uh, fully licensed so that they can engage uh, nominated representatives. Um, something just to bear in mind as well, slightly different. Point. We will talk a little bit more about uh, financial advice, um, well, about uh, nominated representatives later on as well, because for most small financial advisor businesses, it's just not applicable. It's really applicable to larger businesses and designed for uh, essentially their replacement to QFE advisors. Um, just moving into the disadvantages, we've got a question that's come through Q and A, and I'll read that in a, mo in a moment. But I'll just go through uh, the advantages, the disadvantages first. Hand over to Tim while I read those questions. First one: uh, disadvantages of carrying a license. Of course, you carry the full liability for the advice and the business, and you've also now got contagion risk. So if if you carry a license, and this is particularly applies if there's more than one financial advisor in the business. If you've got one financial advisor in the business and it's you, there's there's no contagion. Uh, but if you've got five or six financial advisors beneath you and one of those advisors done so does something egregious and the FMA drag the business over the coals, it is possible that the business could be affected by the poor advice given by one advisor. So you carry contagion risk. You're responsible for all the advice obligations, for every, every piece of advice that comes out of your business. Uh, and you're also responsible for compliance of the business itself. So, you know, your financial requirements, your governance requirements, all those sorts of things, which we will cover in later webinars. Uh, your processes and things we'll cover in later webinars as well. And probably you'll, of course, pay the licensing costs and you'll keep up to date. Uh, we'll have to keep up to date with all the requirements as we get more information about requirements or as requirements change. So there, some of those are essentially, as you can see, the inverse of the advantages uh, of being, the advantage particularly of being engaged by another business. If you're engaged by another licensee, then some of the disadvantages that you have is that your licensee defines your systems and processes. So you don't get to determine how you give advice, uh, your, depending on how your arrangement is with your licensee. But because your licensee is responsible for the advice you give, they're going to want to have some control about how you give it. So they'll define the systems and processes in most cases. Uh, if there is non-compliance elsewhere in the business, you could quite possibly be affected. As I said before, that whole contagion risk thing. You also have um, a, a mobility disadvantage. So if you're, a, as a financial advisor, you're engaged by another business, you decide you want to move on and go to something else, you, if, to get another role as a financial advisor, you will either have to be engaged by another business that already has a license, or you'll have to start a licensed business. So it's a little bit more restricted than it is today when it's, you know, you can be employed by any business you like or start up on a dime. Um, you, your mobility is a little bit more limited. And there would quite probably be restrictions on selling what we these days call your book, your, your book of clients. Uh, if, you know, you, you couldn't sell it to somebody who isn't a financial advisor, for example, because you can't give advice on it. Um, the, the licensee will possibly have restrictions on to whom you can sell. So there'll be some, uh, some sorts of restrictions there. Tim, can I hand that over to you for comment? Yeah, I think um, the, the points being made are, are well made, and the, um, the, the this is a converse of, our, of the previous slide, of course. Um, you know, the disadvantages and advantages, uh, you know, reflect each, are, are relative, so therefore um, correspond. So I think um, the points we've made earlier are, are right. Um, the uh, we have had clients. Uh, who have come to us and, and thought that they may well want to establish um, a network of um, of financial advisors under their their limb uh, or uh, under their license, and they have um, when we've started talking about it, made quite clear that they're only they're quite selective as to who they want to take responsibility for, and um, those conversations are, are sort of reasonably early on. Um, and, and some of the people who have been working around them, uh, you know, may not realize that this rule is being run over them in a way and that they, they may not be able to, um, or they should not assume that just because they're working alongside somebody that that, that person will want to take liability for them. Um, that's been sort of something we've witnessed. We've also um, seen uh, 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 people looking at their structures and finding that it, with their first assumption is that they, they will continue on as usual and have multiple companies and the like. Um, 
uh, in their group and, and, and to come up with quite elaborate plans of, of um, authorised bodies and, um, and, and multiple FAPs. And really, um, our view, like Mark said earlier, is uh, the best thing to do, as always, is to, is to keep the structures as simple as you possibly can, um, consolidate um, uh, your uh, business or your advisory businesses as much as you possibly can into, into one entity that's licensed that will keep licensing fees and duplication of obligations uh, to the minimum. So um, that's another aspect. Uh, we've talked about generally. Mark, you, any Q&A questions? Um, there are a couple here that I'll cover off, or we can cover off quickly. The first one is that an, a financial advisor cannot escape liability for conduct obligations by being under a financial advice provider. Do all the com advisor compliance, re remains, uh, compliance requirements remain on the financial advisor? It's a little bit of a, a mix up there. The, the financial advisor is responsible, of course, for giving the advice. And the business, of course, shares that liability. The compliance is uh, sits within the business, and the, but the, the business will set its own compliance framework. And of course, is checking that things are happening correctly. So the financial advisor is not responsible for making sure those checks occur. They're responsible for making sure that the advice that they issue is compliant with their own obligations. It's the business that's responsible for essentially the compliance activity, if that's what you're asking. Uh, but there may be there are many many ways of structuring compliance, of creating a compliance framework, and many of them may involve both. Uh, but the answer to your question is really that the compliance responsibility sits on the business. Any comment on that, Tim? I, mean, I think that covers it pretty well, actually, man. The, the second question is a, uh, is a question around, uh, it's really a, a question around business commerciality. So uh, the question is, is commission going forward going to be paid directly to the license holder? Um, at this stage, the law does not have any requirements around this. Uh, how commissions are paid to financial advisors will be determined by the providers and the advisors and the advisor businesses themselves. So um, the, the law has no particular requirements here. Um, when the, the conduct of financial institutions legislation gets um, debated and, and essentially goes through law, there may be some tweaks uh, to, to or some requirements around commission that may cause changes there. But at this stage, there's, there's no there's no requirement in law and it'll all just be done by commission agreements. Yeah, I think um, the proposed legislation that's coming through in two or three years time, we understand by the time it's introduced um, the conduct of financial institutions legislation is, has got the potential for impacting um, commissions quite severely. Um, uh, and there's um, a lobbying round going through and, and an opportunity to, to present to select committee on the breadth of those reforms um, if you're worried about commissions. Uh, in, um, in relation to commissions, there are ways of structuring um, the arrangements to separate out the uh, financial advice um, component and the remuneration component. If you want to, for example, preserve um, a company structure um, that uh, means that um, the advice fees are paid into a company when you're a single um, financial advisor. They uh, um, are a wee bit more elaborate than the simple, um, but that can be done. Um, and likewise, um, dealer groups, uh, that if uh, FAPs are willing to engage with dealer groups who are not FAPs themselves, uh, then uh, there are ways to structure the arrangements so that the, the remuneration goes down that, that dealer group channel if that's the best way forward and to effectively bring together um, uh, clusters of, of uh, brokers to negotiate um, uh, attractive terms and binders with uh, insurers, for example. Um, so uh, that's an area that is, it's a very good question. The answer is simple. It's not as simple as uh, yes, all commissions will need to be paid to the person engaged, it is possible to structure it in a different way, but that 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 is the sort of starting point, I guess, because the um, the financial advisor needs to be engaged by the FAP. So any intermediary um, uh, will, if you're not um, an interposed person, any intermediary uh, would not autom autom ordinarily appear as if it's going to receive the commission for, for for the advice given by that direct engagement with the financial advisor. Okay, cool. Thanks, Tim. The, so the first and most important thing is to, to look at the advantages and disadvantages very, very carefully as a financial advisor 
and decide which way is right for you. There is no right, no right answer, no wrong answer. It's all about you. Watch which one suits you best. If you make the decision that you want to be engaged by another entity, then that's what this next part of the, the presentation is about. So do not assume that your financial advice provider will obtain a license and engage you. It's got to be a conversation. So here are, without jumping ahead too far, a few of the questions that you'll want to ask. The first question, and so this is a discussion between you and the business you're thinking to be engaged by. First question is, is that business going to obtain a license? And the second question is, do you want to be engaged by this business? The third question is equally important. Does this business want to engage you? So it's a two-way conversation here. Are you comfortable working together when this whole liability and compliance stuff sits over the top that doesn't exist today? Next question that you want to ask then is how much is it going to cost you? Because there is cost to running this business and that cost will have to be shared with the advisors. So how, whether it's writing a check or sharing your commission or however it works, uh, whether it's being paid a salary instead of being paid a, a commission as a contractor, however that works, there is some cost. You want to understand what, the, what that cost is. Then there are some, some costs that can be marginal uh, that can be paid either by either party and you want to make sure who's, you know who's paying these. Who's paying your FMA level for being a financial advisor? Who's paying for your DRS membership? Who's paying for your PI cover? I suspect that will move into a paradigm where the financial, licensed financial advice providers will actually take uh, DRS membership and PI cover over their entire entity rather than being individual as it is today. You do want to make sure that you're having that conversation and checking that that's the case. What systems and processes will you use? Uh, how will the business check that your advice is complying with their, their standards and your obligations? So what, uh, what compliance activity is going to happen around the advice that you're giving? Very importantly, what's going to change from how you operate today? So assuming that everything's going to continue exactly as it is now is, is absolutely a fallacy. The businesses themselves, as you'll find over the course of the series, will be making changes to their systems, their processes, their technology. Uh, and so you want to make sure you've got an idea of what's going to change and whether you're comfortable with those changes. And will the product, product range that you offer be limited? And one of the advantages, I, I don't remember mentioning it, it might have fallen off the slide uh, from before, is that if you've got your own license and you decide that you want to extend into a different type of product, you know, you're an insurance advisor now, you want to extend into mortgages, as the license holder, that change can be quite quick. Uh, but if you're an, engaged by a business, convincing the business to take on that extension of product range can be quite a different activity. So that there's some limitations there. So will that product range be limited? Uh, Tim, do you have any comments on those questions? I think that's um, that's, a, that's a good list of questions you've got there, um, and they're very practical and commercial. The, we have got a couple of uh, questions come through Q&A that we can cover off at this stage. So the first one was one that I was holding over to the next part, but I'll cover it off now. Um, actually, no, I, I think I will hold it off. Um, so... Uh, the advisor, I won't name you just in case, um, with the, uh, the initial CL, we will come to your question in the third part of the presentation. Uh, so the next part, question, so can, I, un I can understand what makes me attractive as a financial advisor for a licensee, but what factors should I be considering to ensure that the financial advice provider can fulfill their obligations to protect me and the others under that financial advice provider? That's a really good question. And that, that's, that's an excellent question to ask. If I'm going to be engaged by this business, how do I know that that business is going to keep me safe as a financial advisor? How do I know they're going to meet the requirements? Um, Tim, do you want to have a whack at that question first? You know, it is a good question. And I guess we have focused solely on the other way around. Is that how are you going to, being the person at the coalface, uh, engage properly with, with the customer? Um, I guess it, it's, a, it's going to be a question of judgment, really. Um, the FMA will be overlooking all uh, uh, financial advice providers um, to ensure that they meet the standards. So over time, uh, there may well be some um, uh, confirmation or, or more particularly sort of some indications uh, that, that, that the FAP the isn't meeting the standards if they're not. I guess industry conversations, um, you know, what are you doing? Um, listening, uh, listening and understanding um, you know, as to what the requirements are and forming your own assessment. Um, but there's there's no um, there's no nothing no nothing in the process that looks a bit the other way back and and asks that that very good question um, other than just good commercial judgment I guess and um, and talking to people who understand what the reasonable requirements in the industry are and making sure that they're they're being imposed. 
Thank you, Tim. Um, I'd also recommend that, you know, just follow the series of webinars that we're, we're, that we're going to do and you'll get an idea of what the requirements for the financial advice provider are and that'll give you some good ideas of the questions you might want to ask. Okay, so if you've decided then that you want to obtain your own license so on the flip side of this conversation, uh, then that's what the next part of the presentation is about. As we've said a couple of times, both Tim and I through this presentation, the simplest structure for your business is likely to be the best. Very importantly, I know we've got a couple of FMA people on, on the line and I hope I haven't said anything uh, that they want to slap me for so far, but I know that this next line is something they will appreciate me saying. Do not structure your business to avoid your obligations. The FMA are smart people and they see through these kind of structures and all you're going to do is add complexity to your business and not actually succeed in avoiding your obligations. It's this is about doing the right things for clients. The whole purpose of this, of this uh, change in legislation is to help ensure that everybody giving financial advice is doing the right thing for clients. We should all be aspiring to that goal, not trying to circumvent that goal. So let's keep it simple. Having said that, look at this wonderful slide. Uh, this slide is actually a slight enterprise person. So generally, this is about how the, the law is structured, and then we've got to take your businesses and come out and squeeze them into this, this legal structure. The first thing that I want to state here is that the term financial advice provider relates to either a company or an individual that is licensed who issues financial advice to, a, um, a, to an individual, right? The, the entity that holds the license, whether it's an individual or a company, is a financial advice provider. Authorized bodies are also financial advice providers, and these interposed persons are also financial advice providers. One of the um, misjustices, one of the, uh, the injustices that we do to you as, as financial advisors is when we're often talking about this stuff, we refer to this, the license holder as a financial advice provider. We refer to the authorized body as, a, as the authorized body and the interposed person as the interposed person, but they're actually all financial advice providers. It's just that this one here is the one that carries the license. So just be a little bit careful with that terminology. Now, uh, so the licensee is an entity, usually gonna be a company that has the license issued by the, financial, by the financial markets authority. An authorized body is a company and this exists when you've got multiple companies sharing the same license structure. One of them holds the license as the licensee, and the other ones will be authorized bodies under that license. If you think of a situation where you've got um, subsidiary companies, like you know, banks and things will have the main company and then they'll have a bunch of subsidiaries. But authorized bodies under the financial markets called like they were actually designed for that purpose. So you've got multiple companies that are, that are involved in, in providing the financial service, um, and they all had to be given some legal, legal status. The change in, for financial advisors is that the authorized body doesn't have to be related to the licensee. It can be a different company. Okay, so that's where you might have, for example, a dealer group that gets a license and your company coming in as an authorized body under that license. But it is a company. An interposed person is also a company that issues financial advice. It sits outside the license. Uh, and the, the trouble with interposed persons is the way that they've been legislated. And the key point is when, when an entity applies for a license and says, I'm the licensee, these are authorized bodies, and by the way, this company over here gives advice on our behalf as an interposed person, the FMA can at that licensing stage say, no, we don't like it. That company's got to get its own license. And so that creates a large amount of uncertainty. So most of us in the industry, when we talk, we kind of push interposed persons aside and say, hey, look, forget those. If you're in a big structure that uses call centers and stuff like that, yeah, get some legal advice on interposed persons. Uh, but if you're a small business with a few companies in your structure, then I'd you know, just kind of ignore that, leave it to the side. And similarly with nominated representatives, for most small financial advice businesses, we get a lot of people that say, oh, yeah, what, I, am I a nominated representative under my business? Think about nominated representatives as kind of like bank tellers, right? So... They're, they're people that aren't fully trained in financial advice. The systems and processes control how the advice is given, uh, whereas a financial advisor is individually trained, knows exactly what they're doing, and can have the reins to some extent taken away from them. Most people on this call will be financial advisors. You're trained. You know what you're doing. You're not bank tellers. So if you 
Uh, unless you've got a larger structure with a number of people and there's some value in, in considering nominated representative, just throw them out of your mind. Think about financial advisors, licensees, authorized bodies. They're the ones that are most relative to, are relevant to you. Um, so don't consider authorized uh, nominated representatives unless you're asking for some help. Because they're, they're a bit of a red herring for the, for the sake of most people on this call. The last comment that I want to make on this slide is that provider, all the licensees, authorized bodies, and enterprise persons, which we'll ignore, all have FSP numbers. And each financial advisor also has their own FSP number. Nominated representatives don't, but of course we're ignoring those because they're not relevant to most people on this call. Anything to add about the legal structure, Tim? Yeah, just um, the importance of being registered um, prior to uh, the introduction of the regime for financial advisors. Um, there are a lot of the requirements depend on, on being registered. So in some cases, people who have been providing advice, um, uh, in, particularly in sectors such as in, um, where, where they don't, haven't needed to be registered previously, uh, it's important that they be registered before the commencement of the regime, otherwise they'll miss out on, on um, the opportunities. Okay, thank you. Now what we're going to do for, for the next uh, few slides is talk through some common structures of financial advisor businesses and how they generally fit into the regime. So the first one that we want, I want to talk about here is a sole trader in particular. So you've got a financial advisor who does not have a company. One advisor, no company, the advisor has an FSP number, and it is possible for the sole financial advisor to get a license as a sole trader. There are, however, important disadvantages to doing so. So I'll mention three now, and then I'd recommend that you get some legal advice or speak to your accountant or your lawyer, um, to, uh, and adding to the mix these disadvantages and make us an informed decision about whether getting a license as a sole trader is the right thing for you. First disadvantage, this is a bit of a, a strange irregularity, but it's important to know, a sole advisor who gets a license is not allowed to call themselves a financial advisor because you're a financial advice provider and the law says you can't be both. So your business cards will have to change, your website will have to change, you can't say I'm a financial advisor, you say I'm a financial advice provider. It's, it's a crazy little point. The second thing is based on the levies that we've been told so far, a sole trader with a license pays a higher annual levy than a a company with one advisor pays. And because you pay a levy as a financial advice provider of what we've been told so far, but it's likely to increase of $225, a financial advisor pays another 267, but a financial advisor who, sorry, a sole trader financial advice provider is an, a financial advice provider giving advice directly to the public pays an extra 737. So it's $500 a year more to be a sole trader with a license. And as I say, we're expecting all of those rates to go up and they haven't been announced. Uh, so, we're, you know, there's a little bit of uncertainty. There. The third point is when you come to exit the business, you are then stuck as a person walking and talking who holds a license and has their business integrated with themselves personally. And the first thing you're going to need to do when you sell your business is separate your business from you. Now, that either means you're only going to be selling a book of clients, which I believe is not going to have as much value as a licensed business and then closing off the license. Or you're going to have to set up a company, apply, for, uh, apply to the FMA to, uh, to move the license from yourself personally to the company. And then you'll have to um, have the, have, prepare that company for due diligence for the buyer. Now, the, your company is not going to have any financial history. It's all going to be tied up with you personally. And you, as many of you will know, you know, when you've got a, as a sole trader, if your accountant's doing your accounts, they're squeezing stuff into the business, try and claim it for tax purposes. So it becomes very difficult to do due diligence on that and disentangle it all. So um, there are three that I see key disadvantages to be careful of. Uh, Tim, anything to add on that? No, I think you've covered that pretty well, actually. No. Another slide that has one company up here and one financial advisor. That's going to be a very, very common structure. The key things to keep, keep your eye on here is the company will need an FSP number and the financial advisor needs an FSP number. So you'll have two FSP numbers. Okay, so that's just a little thing to be careful of. It's the, now, um, the advisor that asked the question before around, I have a company as a transitional financial advice provider. I advise under this company. Do I still need transitional financial advice provider for myself? Okay, now this is the answer to that question. The company holds the financial advice provider license. 
and you are a financial advisor engaged by the financial advice provider. So you do not need a separate transitional license. Okay? The company holds a license, you as an individual are engaged by that company. So that's the simplest structure for a, for a sole uh, advisor business. You have a company, company has an FSP number, company applies for the transitional license, the advisor has an FSP number, and the advisor is engaged by their own company. And now the ownership of the com company um, is, of course, relevant to the application, but it doesn't matter so much. It could be a hus husband and wife partnership. You might have other, um, other directors or other owners in the business. Uh, that's all fine. But ultimately, one company holds a license, one, one financial advisor. Anything I missed on that point, Tim? I think that's um, that's broadly it. Uh, the yeah, this next one we'll talk more on about the um, the um, the position of an employee in relation to a company. Yeah, th this is this is a uh, a then the the proliferation of that. So this is an advisor business that has more than one financial advisor. So there's lots of different ways that these are structured. But as, as we've said, we've both said before, you want to try and keep your structure as simple as you can. So this is is that that, that very simple illustration. You've got a company at the top. The company will have a number of financial advisors. The advisors might be employees, they might be contractors. You, at least one of the advisors is likely to be a principal of the business. Okay, so the principal is engaged, of course, directly by the company. The, the, the other staff, the other financial advisors, they might be employees, in which case they're, they're gonna be engaged directly by the company just as this principal is. They might be contractors. And in the contractors, you've got two different variations. One is an individual walking and talking that has a contract with the company. The second one that is very, very common is for the individual contractor, perhaps me as a, if I'm a financial advisor, I might have my own company and my company contracts to your business. That's really common for asset separation, uh, for tax efficiency. There's a number of reasons that contractors set up companies. Their accountants will say, oh, you're going contracting? Set up a company, let's get that done and go forward. So that's what this here is set to illustrate. Now, if you think your mind back, or if I'll flick you back to this little structure, look at where the companies sit in this, and we go, oh, that's a bit messy. What do we do with those contracting companies? What we don't want to do, of course, is say to those financial advisors, oh, you can't have a company because it just makes my life painful, because it's a sensible structure for the contractors. So how do we fit them into this structure? Unfortunately, we can't use interposed persons, because the FMA haven't been overly uh, happy to let us do so. So that's why we've pushed interposed persons off to the side. There is this authorized body contract, but the key problem with authorized bodies is authorized bodies carry all of the same obligations as licensees do. They share all the same obligations, all the compliance obligations, all the business obligations, they're all there. So for a small contractor, that's just doesn't make too much sense. So a smart lawyer that I know, Tim Williams, uh, <laughs> suggested that instead of trying to create authorized bodies or cutting things like that, instead we have these three-way contracts between the licensed company, the financial advisor who's contracting, and the contracting company. So you make this the regulatory relationship, but you have the commercial relationship via their company. Tim, can you describe that a little bit more, considering it's your baby? <laughs> So um, the, problem, the problem here stems from the fact that if you have a, a company um, and you're an employee of that company and you want to be engaged by a FAP um, and you want the revenues to go through the, the company rather than directly to yourself for um, tax purposes maybe or uh, for, for a whole range of different reasons, maybe that's the company that holds the lease, et cetera, of, of your business and you don't want to re change that. The problem stems from the fact that um, if, an, if an advisor is giving advice as an employee, that means that the, empl the employer company is also giving the advice in the same way as um, <clears throat> if, if I buy an um, item from a retail store and it's not the um, retailer, but uh, the, the store um, merchant uh, who's selling it to me, it's the company that owns the, the store. So um, now that then leads to licensing requirements if, um, if the, uh, or um, engagement requirements. So the company uh, would then need to be engaged by the FAP, but the, as Mark says, uh, at the, you need a condition in your um, license uh, allowing you to engage companies rather than individuals. And it's proposed during transition that those conditions won't be granted. Uh, there's a particular uh, fairly limited relief for um, established arrangements on the 9th of April uh, 2019. 
Um, so that creates uh, this difficulty. Uh, it could be resolved by having an agreement between, uh, in our view, with the, between the FAP, the company, and the uh, financial uh, ad advisor, provided the financial advisor is not an employee, is a contractor uh, to its own company, which enables that the uh, company, uh, so the, the FAP pays the commissions to the company, um, and the uh, financial advisor is still engaged by the FAP, the FAP directly to perform services. Um, and the, company, the remuneration structure would be that the compensation is for procuring the financial advisor to perform those functions as an engaged employee. And that's why the remuneration rightly goes to the, the company. So there's a bit of complexity in this. It's uh, Marx and I have, t uh, have branded that as a tripartite agreement. Um, and, uh, but uh, we are aware of some providers who are looking very closely at this as a means to provide flexibility for their financial advisors. I also want to note there that I believe the third webinar in this series is dedicated to the contracts. Uh, so we'll get onto that in more detail later in the series. And that actually relates to a Q&A &A question that's come through here. If you've been engaged by someone else's FAP for say 12 months and you felt it wasn't working for you, would it be difficult to get your own client base out of the existing license into a new FAP or your own FAP? The, the answer there again comes down to contracts. So what does the contract between you and the licensed FAP say? That's, that's absolutely the determinant. So be very careful with when you're negotiating those contracts. Uh, into your own FAP, of course, will come down to uh, the um, needing to get a license for your own FAP and having to get a full license from the word go. So in summary, uh, just the last couple of slides here, I apologize that we're, uh, we're running, there's a lot of content here. First thing, and this is what you should be doing right now, we're gonna give you homework here. Consider your options before you make a decision. Go carefully, the slides from this are gonna be available to you. Uh, we're going to, and there may be other advantages and disadvantages you can think of. So weigh them up very, very carefully. Second point, don't assume that an entity will engage you. The entity that you're currently working with, don't assume that they're gonna engage you. And the third one, uh, when it comes to, if you decide to go for your own license, keep your structure as simple as you possibly can. That's a summary really of the, of the points that we've covered off today. Your next steps that we would recommend here, as I say, evaluate the advantages and disadvantages of either approach. Do you make your decision? Do you prefer, prefer to be engaged by a licensee or to get your own license? Any area of uncertainty, just as you do, Get advice, just as you recommend to your clients, get advice. So you might need some legal advice, you might need to talk to an accountant or tax specialist, discuss these things to help you make your decision. And if you decide that you wanna be engaged by a financial advice provider, you've gotta open discussions, do that now. You know, talk about the questions that we've got on those slides, there may be other questions that you have as well. And if you decide that you're gonna go for your own license or a license for your business, it's time to start figuring out your structure. And over the course of what we're covering off through the series, we'll be getting into more details about next um, things to approach. And on that note, the next webinar, are we gonna work through the requirements from the first day of implementation? So from early March next year, we're gonna go through the legal and regulatory requirements and the transitional licensing requirements because these are the things that are all gonna come into effect on day one. Um, you'll also want to, at that point, be preparing for the full licensing requirements, which, if you may, listeners, we are eagerly awaiting, please. Um, Tim, any final points before we ask people to respond to the end up poll? I'll just well, I, I think the, the, the key points is around the timing um, aspect that, that, it's, uh, that there's a lot to be done before the um, March next year. And... Um, and, and, and those things you know, need to be sort of underway or started soon if you're not, if you're not already on, on top of it. Um, because the commencement date, uh, understanding the commencement date is really effectively for most things from um, early March next year, not in 2023. That's a really key point, I think, that we want to emphasise. Okay. There are a couple of final Q&A questions to knock off. Um, in the example that we've given with the tripartite agreement, the contract company won't have an FSP number. That's something we'll cover off a little bit more in the contracting, but my understanding is the contracting company won't be part of the regulation, so no, it won't need an FSP number in that tripartite agreement. Second question here, is there any impediment to adding financial advisors to your financial advice provider? So if you get a license, 
Is there any impediment to adding other financial advisors to that license after early next year or after March 2021? Um, the answer to that question is, is kind of multifaceted. First point is, if there are an existing financial advisor that can benefit from the uh, education safe harbor, uh, then they can transition into another financial advice business. If they're new to the industry, they're gonna to have to meet those level of five requirements before they can give financial advice. So that's the first point I'd make. The second point about adding financial advisors, my understanding from the FMA is if you haven't changed the nature of your business, it's not really a big deal of taking more people into your business. So if you've already got seven financial advisors and you take on an eighth one, uh, not a big deal. You might want to just flick an email to the FMA and let them know, uh, particularly in the early stages. If you're a one advisor business and you take on a second one, that's a fundamental change to the way your business runs. So you'll want to notify the FMA and they may have some questions for you around that. You may need to apply for a variation to your transitional license, which isn't a big deal. So uh, there may be some procedural things to do, but they're not going to be significantly major. Um, any, any points to add from you on that question, Tim? No, I see that Richard's telling us that time is up, so um, I'll hold back. Cool. Well, there's another um, question here that I'm, I apologise, Richard's telling us we have to wipe out and uh, and ask you to respond to the poll. So uh, if that last person that asked the question, feel free to get in contact with us directly and we can try and ask that question off. Thank you very much, everybody, for attending. I hope you got some value out of this. Uh, and please send feedback directly. And the poll is a, a ask other question. Uh, or it's got an email address for the FSC, give them some feedback, tell them what you want to know about so that we can structure the future webinars on that basis. Uh, and I hope we'll see everybody in the next webinar in two weeks' time. Thank you very much to Tim for helping out with this one. Uh, and I look forward to speaking to you all soon. Richard, I think we hand back to you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Tim, for your very timely and expert uh, deep dive into this conversation. Folks, hope you got a lot of value out of that. Um, have a super long weekend, fill in the form, tell us what else you want to hear about, and I'll leave you with the dulcet tones of one of the 1980s best bands, Sultans of Swing by Dire Straits. Travel safe. Have a great one. Bye.